you know, transportation has been such a, a hot topic in Montpelier and with good cause. I mean, we um, it is uh, the number one uh, source of greenhouse gases uh, for Vermonters and undoubtedly for Montpelier. And so it's really it's worth addressing. Um, and uh, there are a lot of organizations that are engaged in thinking about the future of transportation in Montpelier. And so tonight is really um, an opportunity to hear from a variety of organizations about their work and what the future may hold and to ask some questions um, about what, uh, what they're presenting. So uh, I've got the uh, agenda uh, up here um, in terms of the order. Um, the uh, one other thing that I want to make sure that I don't forget to say is that the uh, the Regional Planning Commission um, for Central Vermont, Central Vermont Regional Planning Commission, is also planning a transportation um, event uh, meeting, which is on October 2nd, also a Wednesday, um, in this same space uh, at 6 o'clock. It's supposed to go 6 to 8.30. Uh, and one of the things um, that I'm really excited about for that conversation is that that will bring a more regional perspective. And of course, for a topic like transportation, it makes sense to have a regional dialogue as well. Um, I'm glad that we're doing this still here too, um, but uh, that's another opportunity for you to engage in this topic. So um, put that on your calendars as well. Just make sure, I just wanna make sure I didn't forget to say that. Uh, and so just for the structure of how tonight's conversation will go, uh, so we'll have a presentation from an organization um, somewhere in the ballpark of 15 minutes, um, but saving some time afterwards for uh, questions, uh, comments uh, to be uh, uh, direct, uh, directed at that particular topic um, just after um, their presentation. And if you try to keep your comments relatively short, uh, two minutes is a good ballpark. Um, if you're asking a question. Um, so that's, uh, that's sort of the frame for everything. Um, and I, I know this, there are a number of uh, city councilors here as well. Uh, we'll, we'll be you know, just uh, operating in the same uh, premise that uh, if we have comments or questions, then we'll get up to the mic and, and ask them um, from here as well. So the public, once, once you have questions or comments, um, if you would come up here and introduce yourself and, and then you can ask your question. I think that's everything. Any questions before I move on? Okay. Uh, yeah, it's the teacher in me. I have to, you know, <laughs> still check. Uh, all right. So um, first up, we have uh, All Earth Renewables. Um, so I'd like to invite them up, and I think they have a presentation. And so feel also feel free to introduce yourself. I mean, I could introduce right. you, but I will let you do that. Would you prefer that mic or this one? Oh, I mean, use either one? You can use either one, I, I assume, right? Yeah. That, 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 that one, one is taped. You can't walk everywhere with it. Just let me know when you want to snap. Well, good evening. Can you hear me? Is that working? Okay. Uh, I'm Dave Blittersdorf from All Earth uh, Renewables, but I have all these other companies called All Earth Rail and All Earth E-Bikes and All Earth Heat Pumps. And so uh, obviously I'm trying to do something about this CO2 crisis that we're up against, which I consider the biggest crisis human civilization has ever dealt with. So uh, it's one of those things that we're all in. And turns out uh, I discovered after playing with model railroads or trains when I was a kid and growing up in uh, near the Rutland area of seeing you know the freight trains um, that rail is a very important part of our future so we're talking about the future but we also have to look at our past and what we attempted to do before the automobile overwhelmed us uh, and created Suburbia created the problems we have in consuming tremendous amounts of carbon-based fuels. So I'm gonna talk for the 15 minutes here about a piece of this uh, rail back to the future renaissance. And it's really talking about between Barry and Montpelier. It's an obvious place to do a, a rail link. 
Thanks. Next so, one. keep going. So here we are, back to the future. Um, we're going to have to change our lifestyle. The, the auto-centric system does not work going forward. It's too energy intensive, too polluting, and it's our number one uh, cause of climate change. Lots of CO2, lots of oil used, uh, and it's a big deal. So we're gonna go and I think we're gonna revive rail. And we in Vermont are small enough uh, and hopefully nimble enough to do this. And so what I am bringing to the table, and I've invested a tremendous amount of resources to bring these bud cars to the state of Vermont. And you'll see as we go through what these cars are like and why they're important and why it's probably the appropriate solution to what we're trying to do here right in this uh, corridor between Barry and Montpelier and even around the whole state of Vermont. Next. So we call this community rail. It's not passenger rail, it's not commuter rail. Community rail connects communities. And that's what we're looking at. We have to rebuild our communities. We're doing things in this state based on the automobile that disconnects communities. We're breaking our, we're moving our elementary schools out of town. That's a bad thing to do. Things that are in your town that make the community are your schools, your hardware store, and, and living. And we have to rebuild these things. And that's what this is really all about. And one of the things we have, a rail infrastructure that other states have destroyed and, and torn up, but we still have rail lines all around the state that can work. Next. So here's a bunch of reasons why this can work right here. It's an obvious place to start. Um, we can connect these two towns. They're small towns, even though they're considered Montpelier as a city. It's really quite small. And uh, we, we have to, I think, build up the housing and the density and the people living in these two uh, areas and connect them. And there's a lot of jobs. Uh, the state has offices in Barrie. They have offices here. There's a way that people should move without getting in their car and going down uh, and driving over the Barrie Montpelier Road. Uh, housing, all these other things. Sorry. So here's the corridor. Um, and keep going. So one of the things that uh, was just put in uh, is a build grant. Um, <laughs> So it's a planning grant to uh, plan this corridor and how we can uh, put rail into it. So it's a rail planning grant. Uh, it's a, it was put in by the local regional uh, planning folks and uh, hopefully we'll have an announcement uh, by the end of the year if it's granted. And it's a fair amount of money. It's, it's a little less than a million dollars to plan this um, as we go forward. And as I said, it's basically, we're looking at eight miles of track. Um, the state owns the rail line. It's leased to Vermont Rail Systems. It's used for freight. They're actually hauling more uh, granite tailings out right now. Uh, they're fixing up a little bit to keep those freight trains going at 10 miles an hour or less. Hopefully not derail too much or trucks run into them. Um, but uh, the track needs an upgrade. And we're not talking about welded rail. We're not talking about high speed or medium speed. We're talking simply class two, 30 mile per hour rail so that we can move uh, passenger bud cars uh, at a reasonable speed because you won't go any faster. Um, and right now, I believe VTrans is working on uh, uh, a stretch of track, laying down new track to avoid two bridges that uh, um, have some issues with hauling a lot of freight over them. But that really doesn't matter to us. Our cars are, are a little less than half the weight of a, a, a freight car that's hauling the granite. So we can run over the bridges if we want. Here's, uh, you've seen the pictures of the bud cars. Um, 
the neat thing is it's, I call it back to the future because these were all built in the 1950s. They were totally remanufactured. I mean remanufactured, not refurbished. They were stripped and rebuilt with new engines, new uh, systems in 1995. And the reason they, they last so long is they're all stainless steel and they don't rust. Uh, and they're r ruggedly built and they're considered heavy rail. You hear about light rail. But these are heavy rail cars that can mingle with freight uh, because freight is heavy rail. You can never mix light and heavy rail. So that, these are the right uh, rail cars to, to run. A uh, little graphic of what it looks like. It has two uh, engines under the floor. Uh, so uh, and they're self-powered and they're bi-directional. So you don't have to turn them around. Um, if we were on some welded rail somewhere, they will actually go 85 miles an hour. Uh, so they will get up and go. <laughs> Next. There's an inside of one. Um, they were kept in great shape. They came from uh, Dallas, Texas. Uh, they were so successful in introducing uh, the rail system there that they had to go to double-decker passenger cars and locomotive hall because they had too much ridership and it was because of these bud cars that they got ridership and got a system working. Um, just quickly on plan stops, um, we're laying out basically our first guess at an operating plan just so that you know I own rail car assets. I am not an operator of railroads. That will be done by somebody else, a transit authority, uh, either state or regional. But I provide the hardware. So what we're outlining here or laying out right now is sort of a vision of what we think can be done. It has to be fine tuned, but it will be a start of what we're looking at. So here's a corridor start and stop and maybe a couple stops in between to be determined. Next. So what we're looking at is to have some frequency, uh, three trips in the morning, three, in the after, three uh, late evening or in the evening and two midday. You need enough frequency to get people to ride and, and so we need a midday run, a couple of runs. These are all half hour runs, half hour each way. It's only seven point something miles and we think we can do that run in less than a half an hour. Now when we stop we're not going to stop for 10 minutes and sit around. It's like we stop and we go. It's like a bus in a city uh, that you know you don't have 10 minutes to get on the bus because your route is shot. So we're looking at the half hour run time. We think it's, it's reasonable. Average speed is about 25 miles an hour. These cars will get up and go, like I said, so they're not like a uh, Amtrak train that takes a mile or two to get up to speed. Uh, these will accelerate pretty fast, but not as fast as subways. Uh, we estimated about uh, 6,000 trips a year. Here's some of the estimated cost and what we think ridership could be. And it's basically about a million dollars a year and that's our best guess at this point. Uh, we're still working on insurance and the infrastructure improvements of the track is not included. If we rebuilt using uh, recycled rail, new ties, ballast, um, we think the route could probably, the track could be upgraded for maybe $3 million. We aren't totally sure without the study being done, but it's a good estimate. It's not 12 million, it's not 20 million. Um, so uh, it can be reasonably done. And again, we try to do it the Vermont way. We don't gold plate it. Uh, we do what's necessary to make it work. Uh, as far as some cost numbers, we think it would cost about $5.50 for a run uh, each way. Um, and compared to driving a car at 58 cents a mile, at $4.64, and then if you have to park your car, if you can't find free parking, it's more expensive to drive your car. A lot more. Next. Again, here's what we're 
talking about. We're not going to operate. We're going to have to find somebody to operate. Green Mountain Transit's high on our list uh, and others. Uh, I believe we need a transit authority, not a train authority, not a bus authority. We have to integrate bus, trains, everything. And that's where a central authority or uh, operator uh, is very important. Um, after coming up with the community rail uh, idea and the name, we started doing a little research. Turns out in England, the United Kingdom, they've been doing this for a number of years. And, and Deb figured out and said, oh my gosh, there's a whole uh, section of England serving rural communities with community rail. There's thousands of people working this and it works. And it works at the lower density levels. So very important model. Next. And a lot of the folks that are working on community rail in uh, the UK are volunteers. They want this to work. Uh, the kids go to school on these systems. You know, we can't even get kids to uh, be legally walking to school these days, but they put them on trains, they walk, they do these things. This is what we have to do. Next. So there's this question of, does rail really help your local community? Yes, it does. Uh, if we invest, for every dollar we invest in public funds, in Dallas, they figured out you got a $7 private investment because investment goes into around rail stations when you get it working. And so the private money shows up. The other thing that happens is uh, you have other economic activity. So it goes to 10 to 1 leveraging. It works. And, you know, people do want to live around services. They don't want to drive anymore. So this is important. Here's what happens on the carbon side. Um, there's, there's multipliers that happen. Just direct fuel savings is not the whole game. It is about three times better for, for fuel. You get carbon savings about 5.3. And this was all done by a study that we referenced. And it turns out riding a train, one person, instead of a single car, is over 100 times less carbon. That's a big number. It's not just one-to-one -one on fuel. The whole system is less carbon. So this is a very, very important number. So if you get one person on train, that's like over 100 cars off the road. It's big. If you doubt it, go look at that study. It's very, very interesting how it all works out. As I said, the model has already been done. You know, we don't always like to look to the Europeans to model what we might want to do in the United States, but they have figured out some of this stuff, and we really have to look at how it's done there. Next. So, a few things you can do. One of the things that's always asked of me is, where's my train? Where's the train? Where's the train? Support community rail. Next. And as I said, the Vermont Way, we have the cars sitting here. I want to use them in Vermont. I'm a Vermonter. I want it to work. I put a lot of money into it. And now is the time to get moving. Next. Aren't they beautiful? <laughs> Thank you. Any questions for Dave? Come on up. Or would you, uh, actually, we could do this in a way where if, if, if we just uh, have you speak from there, then it won't be picked up on the mic. Could you just I could, we could just repeat it. OK. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah, go ahead. Does the train system go to the Amtrak um, station in Montpelier? OK. That was my first OK, does the Amtrak station go to the, uh, uh, I'm sorry, does this go to the Amtrak station in Montpelier? The track that the state owns goes to the junction. Uh, it's just a matter of uh, getting down there or not. Yes. Yes, it does go to. Okay. 
Yes. We, we can. We could go down to the junction to meet Amtrak. If it happens, then you're going to. Well, it should be decided. Uh, our first priority is to get back and forth between these two cities. And then if we can get over to uh, Amtrak, that's fine. Our ultimate goal is eventually to get to uh, Essex Junction, Burlington, South. But that's a bigger problem. <laughs> Oh, okay. Right. Yeah. Um, right now, Green Mountain Transit is having difficulty getting people to ride a bus instead of driving. Mm -hmm. How, and you've compared it to driving, not to the bus. How would you get people to get in on a train, which has fewer stops than a bus, when it's currently a diff difficult to get them to even ride the bus? Yeah, the question is, uh, it's difficult to get people to ride a bus right now. How am I going to get them on a train? Well, I have a little different vision of where we're going in the world, especially right now. Um, you know, almost 5% of the oil supply just disappeared for a little while. It's going to be a major problem. We have major issues that are going to change our behavior and pricing. Oil, you've heard about peak oil. Well, actually, oil is going to peak and it's really soon, and it's gonna surprise a hell of a lot of people. And so we wanna be ready. And if you're starting to pay $5, $6, $10 a gallon for gasoline, or even if you switch to EVs, your whole system costs go up, your cost of driving goes up, you will move people. And especially if we can get a reasonably priced system working, and initially, I want people on this train no fares. Cities in, in countries around the world are starting to go to free public transit. And that's how you load your transit system, make it work. And then, because right now, when you look at the bus system, you know, they're getting over 80% of their budget elsewhere besides fares. And in rough numbers, you collect 20% fares, and then half of it's due to collection costs. So why bother? And I think that's why buses aren't full. So we're going to look at it a different way. So we talked about peak oil prices. Um, I know this is your diesel fuels. Yep. Uh, how would that affect the operating costs? Well, the operating budget at today's diesel prices, uh, that's only 5% of the cost of operating. Our biggest cost is trackage, insurance, uh, people. So those. When you have a community system and we can get volunteers, we don't need to be having paid station people or anything else. So we're looking at ways to make this all work. But eventually the idea is we're using older technology based on diesels, but eventually we'll electrify all this. And then it will be uh, less carbon and we don't have to worry about the fuel. Anybody else? Okay. Yeah. Not precise numbers, but all you have to do is look at the road and the cars. Uh, there's a fair amount of people. The numbers that I have are that there are 900 people from Barry who work in my career. So I don't even know how many go the other way, but 900 is a, is a big number of people. Yeah. I, I think, you know, there's probably more than 900. You know, I think there's thousands that go each way. Every time I drive that road, it's like, yeah. 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 Oh, we're Yeah. When will be the last train in the evening? Um, well, we aren't sure. We have a three-hour window that we would maybe start at 4 o'clock, 5 o'clock, 6 o'clock, 7 o'clock, maybe 8 o'clock. But the idea is if we can get the first stuff successful, we can always add. But the idea is we got to make it reliable on time. You have to trust the system. And that's why people don't use mass transit, because they can't trust that the, the, the bus or the train will be there on time. You have to run it like the Swiss run it. In Switzerland, if, if the train or bus is gonna arrive one minute early, they stop before the stop 
and wait until they arrive perfectly on time. <laughs> we have to start to do that sort of system, and that's the goal. Uh, the, the idea is to run seven days a week. You have to have this available. That, that, oh, repeat. How do uh, disabled or handicapped people get on a train that, that is running uh, on a tight schedule? Well, we have, act, we have places for the handicapped wheelchair access. There'll probably be a ramp where you can get on. If it's a whistle stop, like if it's a flag stop, probably not. But there'll be places to get on. Yeah, the first question was, uh, how do we deal with uh, the transit center as it was designed? Um, well, uh, these cars allow you to not have a platform to get on. Uh, a platform is better to uh, get handicapped access because you're straight on. But they're designed for both ways. So we can deal with that initially. Um, yep. Because the transit center is designed with a rail platform, and you have been told that on numerous occasions. It's not being built now because there's no active rail, but it is designed to have a platform. So that problem is already solved. Okay, great. Thank you. And so what was the second question again? <laughs> Oh, parking. Right. How, how do we offset parking with, with this rail idea? I think naturally uh, there's, there's ways to use like the Grossman Circle for parking. We've got to move parking outside of the city. This is so valuable right out here. Why are we parking here? We can just be out there. A 10 minute ride, you're into where you want to be. So that's the idea. Displace parking because we have to reduce parking because parking is some of the most expensive real estate uh, and it's very costly. We have more parking spaces in the United States than people. And in some cities, it's 10 times more parking than the people that live there. It's like, it's kind of crazy what we've done with parking. Um, I may not have understood that one slide that you had, so forgive me if I'm misunderstanding it. Um, it seems to me that if you had one person on the train, uh, the gas mileage, well, while it's diesel, I mean, if it's electric, awesome. Um, but if while it's diesel, the, the, um, the ga effectively the gas mileage um, would be worse than if it was a car. So how many people would you need to have on the train for it to be more worthwhile than driving? Um, we used uh, 30 people on, oh, uh, how many people would have to be on the train to offset uh, versus a single car as far as uh, 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 mileage or gas consumption, uh, oil consumption? Uh, we modeled uh, 30 people on the train uh, versus it can handle 90 people sitting, 100 and some uh, standing up, and these cars get three miles to a gallon. So with a little simple math, you can say, okay, 33, you know, it, it's, you can get your effective mileage way up, but that other slide where I showed the multiplier up to over 100, that is because of where people live and what they do in their uh, housing and what they do when they live around a train station. They typically reduce their car use to zero sometimes. And so that's why that number grows so big because their lifestyle changed. And that's the key to make all this work. So um, could you tell us uh, what your personal narrative was in buying these bud cars <laughs> and taking this risk? 
Are you worried about uh, being paid back? Are you letting it out? What's happening? Uh, yeah, uh, what, what was my personal story of why I bought these bud cars? Uh, probably be w without a plan, and, and am I worried about uh, losing my shirt? Um, <laughs> I have over six million dollars in these things, and I have a full-time person up in Barrie uh, reconditioning, bringing them up to uh, uh, ready to go. It's called blue carding. So that I have five cars painted, you know, like that last shot, ready to go. So I am putting more investment in. Am I afraid of, or why did I do this? I did it because I believe possession's nine-tenths of the law. Basically, if you have the hardware, someone's gonna have to do something eventually. And that's where I came from on this, because years ago, you know, I talked to some people and said, what's it gonna take? When are we gonna get trains running in Vermont? A uh, decade or two. Business as usual. Basically, never. If someone shows up and shows pictures of this and shows that it can work, I think we'll move faster. And the number one story when we hauled those 10 cars into Montpelier for the year, uh, what, two years ago, in Vermont Business Magazine, number one story was bringing those cars to Vermont in the whole state of Vermont for a year. So there's huge enthusiasm. It's just that we have to now do something about it. And am I going to lose my shirt? No. Every day since this is out there for two years, I'm getting more and more requests to either lease the cars. The le recent requests are, we want to buy them. I said, no, I'm not selling them. <laughs> These are the last 12 cars in the world that are of this quality and at this price and that can work. I'm not letting them go. I want them here in Vermont. <laughs> If we get the green light, how quickly can we go? Well, it's fixing the track. We have the cars ready. It's really uh, a problem of putting together uh, the transit authority, how it's gonna be run, who's gonna run it. That's the trick, putting that all together. So, I don't know. Depends on who does it and how we're gonna do it. Uh, I think we could do it in, in a year, year and a half. The, the rebuilding of the line won't take that long, but we have to have the plan. We gotta get it out the bid and do it. Um, you know, Vermont rail system, they can put ties in, they can rebalance this stuff. ECI is a contractor that does this stuff. We have people around that can do it. It's just, you just gotta do it. Uh, there is no transit authority for the rail project. What we're looking to do is to uh, get someone to step up or create one. Whether it's Green Mountain Transit, you know, I keep talking about them, but say, come on guys, join us in this transit idea, but uh, maybe it's another authority that is done. Because you can't do it privately, and it has to be regional or statewide to make it work. That's what you're really looking for. Yeah, yeah, somebody has to run this thing. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right, and I know we have a few people here from the Agency of Transportation. I don't know what order you would like to go in, but uh, yeah, go ahead. Good evening. Uh, my name is Dan DeLabriere. I am the Rail and Aviation Bureau Director for VTrans. Um, I don't have a presentation for you. I was asked to kind of come and talk about What's VTrans plan for the rail line through Montpelier? Um, so piggybacking on uh, what Dave said, um, we don't currently have a big plan to start uh, commuter rail on this line right now. Um, the legislature has asked VTrans to um, look at a kind of high level view um, not, a very, not a detailed construction drawing plan, but a high level view of what would it take to get this track upgraded for commuter rail. Um, not necessarily just, you know, not a specific type of car, but commuter rail in general, right? So it's kind of a general ask from the legislature. Um, and to also uh, piggyback on a little bit of what Dave said, we, I agree with Dave, 
rail is a big part of the future, um, not just for passenger, but for freight. Uh, as you probably have noticed, if you guys have lived around here very long, um, there's been an increase in train traffic through Montpelier. Um, it has been probably busier this year than we've seen in a long time. We think that's going to continue. Um, so, um, you know, what's out there for track right now is it's okay for freight, but it's old. Um, the train does go very slow. Um, it's, you know, it's safe, but it goes slow. Um, to turn it over to a commuter type rail, it would need the upgrade that Dave's talking about. We do not know what that costs. We, um, like I said, the legislature has asked us to look at a high level uh, view of that. Um, we have to present that to the legislature this year, um, and we will do that. We, we're in the process of doing that now, uh, that study. Um, we also, like Dave, we're not an operator. So the state of Vermont will not operate a commuter train, just like Amtrak. We don't operate it. We pay Amtrak to operate the train that comes to Montpelier Junction. So we're not an operator. Um, some people have asked, well, why don't you operate that? We're, that's not what we do. It's like we own the highways. We don't run the trucking companies. We, like rail, we own the infrastructure. We don't run the trains. Um, so we are infrastructure, and that's what kind of what we do. Um, so I think... I don't know that I have more to say other than that. Um, that's kind of what our plan is uh, for rail. Um, you know, uh, you know, we'll see where th th these bud cars are an interesting thing for Vermont. I think uh, you know Vermont's fortunate to have this asset, and and we'll see where it goes. I I don't know that VTrans has a plan currently. Uh, people have asked me what's VTrans plan for the bud cars. Well, we don't have one right now. Um, we again, like Dave, we, we if someone came to us and said. Uh, you know, we have a plan to operate them on infrastructure that you own. We're going to look at that, um, but we're not going to operate it. So, no, let's start right here. So the question is, um, will the bud cars uh, can they run? Uh, alongside or with the freight schedule that's going on and so that's part of what we're looking at in the a higher level view is um, there so there's FRA which is Federal Rail Administration rules and um, there's um, transit rules and they have to kind of go together public and and so we have to look at all of that and the answer to that is I'm gonna guess that if there's a commuter rail going back and forth there's not going to be a, a freight train going on the same track. They can't. That's my guess. That is not an a exact statement, but that is that's sort of a guess that they wouldn't be able to work at the same time. You're not going to see a bud car go by and then five minutes later see a freight train go by. Um, you got to kind of protect um, the track. Um, so, right, right here. Well, uh, this is kind of related. This this uh, law, long, large view. Does it, would that include light rail as opposed to heavy rail? Because from what you just said now, if you're operating on, if you're not operating freight on the commuter, then you might be thinking about light rail, which I know the bud cars couldn't operate that way. So we've, a, we've been asked to look at, we're not looking specifically at a bud car situation. We've been asked to look at commuter rail. So it's all included, yeah, and like that. It would be it would be light rail included. So we've been looked. We have to look at commuter rail. That's what we've been asked. Um, so yes. Um, so the question is, can freight run when the times of the commuter rail is not running? And I, I th hopefully, it must be I wasn't clear. So I would say freight would run at a different time than the commuter rail would run. So they it, they can run on the same track, I would say, not at the same time. Yes, in the back. I think uh, I don't have the date in my head, but I think we're that this question is when are we supposed to report back to the legislature? And it is. Um, I'm going to say it's sometime late November. I think our report is due. Um, I'm sure I'll be in the state house uh, this winter talking about it. 
Start. question is what's the scope of the report and the scope of the report is from Montpelier and it's infrastructure upgrades only this is not operating cost this is not you know anything about operating a train it's infrastructure what's the cost of the actual you know rails and ties and ballast so um, so uh, we're, are, we're, we're starting at Montpelier Junction so to answer your question about uh, would it connect or possibly connect to the Amtrak Vermonter um, the infrastructure would be upgraded from uh, Montpelier Junction to downtown Barrie. Um, there's station stops that we will put in a ballpark number for. They're not going to be an exact design, but um, we're looking at whether those have to be, you know, high level level boarding, or if they can be low level. Those are the questions that are um, that we're looking at right now. We're not very far into the study. Um, so I, I don't have answers to those questions, but um, that's part of it, um, is the part of the scope. Uh, I'm Jack Mitchell. I'm a selectman in the town of Barry, and I have been for quite a while, so I'm familiar somewhat with the railroad situation in our area. And my question, I guess, is two things. One, do you plan to talk to the municipalities that uh, do have the rail and to have some discussion on this study? And some of their input. I know it's more with Barry City and Berlin and Montpelier than Barry Town, but uh, since we do the rail for the granite now, the route that's going out, um, when that first started, we had because the railroads are all powerful. Uh, we had some uh, concerned uh, residents that were living right beside the track. The track hadn't been used for 20 years, and then it started to be used. So I guess I just was interested. Are you Did everybody hear the question, or should I repeat that? Okay, so the question was, I'll summarize, do we intend to talk to uh, the municipalities um, to give input into the report? Because it's such a high-level report um, with not a lot of detail, we, we will likely, okay, so I'll backtrack. I don't think the municipality in Barrie is going to be surprised when this report comes out because this is not, um, just like Montpelier, and people know about this report. Um, however, I guess I, I don't currently have plans to reach out to the city or, or, of Barrie, but I, I can. I certainly can. We can get, we can get input. Again, we are infrastructure, we are not operators. So as you can imagine, it was probably all earth renewables that sort of started this question about commuter rail. And before all earth renewables had these cars, um, you know, we didn't, we weren't, we weren't talking about commuter rail between Barrie and Montpelier. Um, we're not an operator, right? So we don't operate commuter trains. Um, so we do have a ra statewide rail plan that talks about passenger rail. Um, the statewide rail plan evaluates the need for that kind of thing. Um, Barry to Montpelier has not been identified as a, a need for that in our statewide rail plan, which is updated um, about every five to 10 years. So it's, it's not, uh, it has not come up before this. It has not come up in our statewide rail plan. Okay, can you tell, give us an update on the runaround, where you are with that? Sure. The, the, your project, and do you think there's a connection between that and the passenger rail? Yeah, I don't know that there's a big connection with, okay, sorry. Um, what the question was is, uh, give us an update on the runaround track. Um, for those of you who don't know what that is, um, so if you go out, over here where the distillery was just built, um, currently the track sort of bears right um, and it goes, um, kind of follows, um, what's that, Route 2, CO2, whatever, um, and follows that over to the, to the roundabout. Um, what 
the runaround track is, that project is, taking that about where the distillery is and actually kind of bearing left and going across, um, is that Berlin Street? Yeah, Berlin Street. So over towards Sabin's Pasture and following along the other side of the river and uh, coming back out and connecting back in over by the roundabout. And the purpose of this uh, project is there's two bridges, um, Bridge 305 and 306 to be exact, um, that are old and are going to need some work eventually. And with all the additional, um, you know, rock movements and things, we're looking at what's the real uh, fiscally responsible thing to do long term? Is it to invest and rebuild two new bridges or go on the other side of the river where you'd never need to cross the bridge ever, right? So, um, so there's no bridges the other way. So we're looking at a project that would um, essentially move the heavy freight on the other side of the river. It's called the runaround track. And it's going to go, um, and actually, this has been sort of um, talked about for a long time. It's just sort of coming into as a project. But um, so where the bike path goes and it meets over by the, runner, by the roundabout, that bike path has been designed to allow for a bike path and a track. So... Um, you know, both of these projects can can go together. So, but are you designing it now? Uh, we're currently in design. We're we're just we're in preliminary design. Design to build or design to decide? Design, I know originally it was like you're just building it, and then recently I heard, oh no, the design is partly to decide whether. To build. We we anticipate building it, uh, but we we don't. Again, we have because we haven't designed anything yet. We don't know what it costs, right? So. As soon as we know what the costs are, we can make a, make a better informed decision to move it beyond design. Um, we anticipate that it will go beyond design, but until we get the final number, we don't know. All right, any other questions on rail? Yes. The commuter, the commuter rail connection? I don't know. I mean, that's why we're doing the study. The oh, sorry. Um, what is the what, in, in, what? What? What do I think the biggest hurdle is uh, to getting the commuter rail running? And um, I'm going to say it's going to be infrastructure. But that's a you know that's a guess. It's there. There needs to be, in my mind, uh, without knowing all the details, uh, I would say there's a lot of infrastructure that needs to be upgraded. You know, platforms and track upgrades and things like that. So. Not this study. This study is simply Montpelier Junction to Barry. That's all it is. And it's, again, high level, not detailed, but it's uh, basically a cost estimate for infrastructure. So uh, go ahead. Does this uh, study include electrification? No. Uh, the question is, does this study include electrification? The answer is no. So the question is, when's the last time that quarter was upgraded? And a long time ago. I mean, they they, they do regular maintenance on it, uh, but there's been no, I don't know when the last one, it's been so long. Um, I've only been with the state for nine and a half years, so it was not, hasn't been upgraded in my time other than, you know, a couple of crossing projects have been upgraded, um, but the actual full line has not been upgraded in my time here. All right. Oh, you have, oh, sorry, one more. Sorry. Is there any investment from the granite industry? So the, the question is, is there any investment from the granite industry? And um, OK, so the granite industry pays the railroad to move their product. Um, the railroad is responsible for doing the maintenance. So. I guess indirectly the customers are paying for maintenance through there. Um, so they don't make any contribution directly to the state as the infrastructure owner. So. But there could be a financial benefit to the state if more of that granted is moved out, isn't that correct? Sure. So, um, you know, there could be, I'll say the question is could there be a, potentially be an advantage to the state if more granite moves? So. Um, 
to get down into the weeds, I guess, a little bit, the we lease the operation of the railroad to Washington County Railroad. Washington County Railroad pays us a lease based on uh, how much money is made on that rail line. So the more money they make, um, you know, the state would eventually get money. The f there, there's a, not to get way down, but there's a certain amount of money that has to be made before the state gets anything. So we've never made it to that yet, but um, certainly if we, if we, um, <laughs> certainly if, but we've never had this much freight movement before. This, this is, uh, you know, this is encouraging to see all this rock moved, so. But there, I will tell you, there's a lot of businesses in these two communities that rely on that rail. So it's, again, rail is very important to businesses around here and jobs around here, so. I don't know that there was a question in there, more of a statement, so. <laughs> Yeah, um, so the question is, um, I think it was, this doesn't have anything to do with connecting to Amtrak. So our study that we're doing, the high-level study, is going to go all the way to Montpelier Junction um, in case whoever is the operator decides that that um, it works into their schedule. So uh, if there's an operator or authority that comes up that says, uh, you know, we're not going to just stop at the transit center here in Montpelier, we're going to keep going all the way to the junction, uh, at least twice a day, right? Meet the northbound and the southbound Amtrak, right? Um, it seems to be crucial as a capital city to, to get to the yeah. Amtrak station. No, I, yeah, so the, the statement was it's critical to get to the Amtrak station, and we, we agree. So, again, we pay, the state of Vermont pays Amtrak to run that train. So we want as many people on that train as possible. And we talk to and work with Amtrak um, a lot about, you know, what's called the last mile, right? So it's how do you get from the train station to wherever people want to go? And, you know, we struggle with that a little bit. Like a lot of skiers come up and they get off in Waterbury. Well, how do they get to, up to Stowe? You know, things like that. So we work, try to work with that type of stuff. Um, you know, and it, on busy weekends, it's great. But on weekends when one person shows up, you know, it's tough, right, for someone to operate a vehicle going back and forth. So, you know, it's hard, but we are working on that. I agree. The last mile is important. You got to get people to the train. Um, so, um, but we've, you know, Amtrak, Amtrak's doing, our Vermonter service is doing very well. So we're showing, you know, that people are riding the train. So it's a good thing. The question was, um, when can we get back to Montreal? I really wish I knew the answer to that. Um, so it's sort of, it's up to a lot of people. It's not just up to Vermont. Um, the infrastructure in Vermont um, has had a lot of upgrades, and we are, um, what we think, we think we're pretty much ready all the way to the border. But when you go across the border, and I've actually taken a train that goes across the border all the way to Montreal, on a, on a trip that we were looking at to, um, to see what it would take. You literally are going, you're, you're cruising right along, you, you can tell when you hit the Canadian border because the train all of a sudden, and it's slow. Um, so there's some significant infrastructure upgrades on the other side of the border, number one. Number two, um, there's still some governmental issues between our federal governments that have to be worked out as far as will Will they let us actually work in another country? 
So that's still going on. Um, the station, there is no design for a station. There is a sort of preliminary sketch, whatever. Long story short, it's complicated and we're a ways away and a lot of questions. We are very involved and we're working on it. I will tell you that um, VTRANS and the provincial uh, government in Quebec, we are having a lot of meetings on this right now. Uh, so we're still working on it, but we're a long ways away. So there's, there's a lot to do. <laughs> So the question is, um, do I think that the community rail idea, uh, I guess, is, would it work or whatever? Um, I think I'm going to pass on that question because I don't know enough about what. So there is no, in the train world, right, there's no official word for community rail, right? Uh, it's, there's, uh, so I'm, I'm going to. Say I don't know to that question. All right, I'm going to pass it on to, thank you very much. John, are you up? Are you going to? Okay. <laughs> Agency of Transportation, part two. Yeah, part two. <laughs> okay. Oh, whoops. <laughs> that wasn't me, right? <laughs> All right. Good evening. Um, my name is John Kaplan, and I am the Bicycle and Pedestrian Program Manager for VTrans. Um, so cha changing gears here, no pun intended. Um, so I guess uh, I was asked to just give a little bit of an update on um, some kind of what initiatives we're working on in the realm of bike and pedestrian transportation um, at VTrans. And um, I think, so timing-wise, because um, we just announced the awards from this, uh, we have an annual grant program, that is probably what we are known for the best, um, and we just announced the awards for this year, um, and that, <coughs> excuse me, consists of, I think it's a little over 25 projects across the state um, that uh, are using uh, $3 million in federal funds and $300,000 in state funds for um, municipal projects. Um, Montpelier has been a regular uh, and successful applicant to the program, so um, there are a number of projects. Both of the PATH projects that are underway, under construction right now, um, have money that has, you know, been awarded to the city. Um, through our grant program and another grant program that's in the same section of the agency where I am. Um, the other grant program is called the Transportation Alternatives Program. Um, and uh, the sidewalks that are being built out uh, on Elm Street, out towards um, the ball field, that is another project that was funded through our grant program. Um, so, Anyway, wanted to at least you know mention that because that is what we're known for the, probably the most, but that is not everything that I do um, in my position. Um, a lot of what I end up working on, I would say is, um, or sort of another big piece is making sure that our agency projects are considering the needs of bicyclists and pedestrians. Um, and that is probably a little more, um, I guess, heavily weighted towards the the bicycle side of things because VTrans doesn't build much in the way of sidewalks on our own system and that's partly because we don't maintain any sidewalks pretty much municipalities are responsible for uh, maintaining sidewalks we will build sidewalks for example um, if we're rebuilding a bridge in a community and there are sidewalks that lead up to that bridge um, that the town is already maintaining or they're agreeing to maintain, um, we will build sidewalk on that new bridge. Um, and that's especially important because that's a piece of infrastructure that's gonna be there for 
75 or 100 years. So it's important to get those right. So that's one of the things that I work on is like coordinating with our structures section to have that discussion about sidewalks on bridges. Um, and then a lot of our bicycle infrastructure on the state system consists of um, paved shoulders on the, on the state highways. Um, sometimes we will mark those as a bike lane, um, especially on, well, one example that's just finishing construction right now is the section of Route 100 between Waterbury and Stowe. Um, so that is all a state maintained route. And if you've been up there, um, there are marked bike lanes in kind of Waterbury, uh, I guess it's Waterbury Center, um, kind of right from the interstate interchange uh, heading north. And then there's another section of bike lanes in Stowe as you approach the village. Um, so that's, you know, some bicycle infrastructure that we built as part of a state project, and we will continue to maintain that in terms of, you know, refreshing those markings. Um, and I guess another kind of more local example is the Barry Montpelier Road. That was a project that I was very involved with in coordination with our paving program and also the town of Berlin that had just done a, um, uh, a feasibility study on making the Barry Montpelier Road more walkable and bikeable. That was all kind of concluding right when the Barry Montpelier Road project was being designed. And so that was a good kind of collaborative effort. Um, let's see, I just I want to make sure I'm not forgetting anything. Um, so that kind of internal coordination, that is something that I do. Um, I would say I do a fair amount of what I would call technical assistance, both in the agency and with municipalities. So, um, you know, if a municipality has a question about bicycle or pedestrian facility design, they often give me a call and we'll have a discussion and try to come up with a solution. Um, so I guess one kind of longer term initiative that we have going on right now is we are just at the beginning stages of um, updating our bicycle and pedestrian strategic plan for the agency. So that is taking a look um, kind of big picture, where should we be headed um, as far as integrating walking and biking into all aspects of what the agency does and coming up with some performance measures to, you know, kind of track how well are we doing at that. Um, let's see, we get a little bit into um, the safety, kind of the behavioral side of things. That is not my expertise. I'm an engineer by, that's what I went to school for, and that's what I've been doing for whatever, 25, 30 years almost now. Um, but we do work in partnership with organizations like Local Motion, which is the statewide bicycle and pedestrian advocacy organization. They do a lot of education work around the state, um, and we try to support them in um, however we can. Uh, so that's kind of a real quick snapshot of um, what we're doing as far as bicycling and walking in the state. Um, and like I said, you know, Montpelier has been an um, active participant in our grant program. Um, and uh, the most recent grant that maybe you know about, I know Corey knows about it, um, is a, one of our small scale projects, which has been a very successful program. That's the state funds portion of our grant program. Um, when it's only state funds, it's much easier to develop projects and get them built um, as opposed to the federal funds, which come with a lot of hoops to jump through. Um, so the small scale projects, uh, the city just was awarded to make a sidewalk connection on Granite Street um, from the sort of end of the truss bridge there down to where the path is coming out. So ha happy to fund that project. <laughs> Okay, so the question was about the bike lane um, on Barry Montpelier Road and um, sort of how well we're assessing whether that's working and also maintaining it in the future. Um, so I'm glad you brought that up. That um, maintenance of 
actually all of our pavement markings on the state system is a real challenge. Um, and I've, I'm actually in pretty active discussions with our uh, maintenance folks right now about how we can um, deal with getting those markings refreshed more regularly. I was, I was just out there sweeping. <laughs> um, we have definitely gotten some, uh, some feedback from the public about the condition of those bike lanes. And I'm in, so I'm very aware of that. Um, and we're, I guess my, my short answer is we are trying to come up with a better way to deal with that. Um, and especially because we are doing more bike lanes now. So we've got to figure this out. I know that with our um, maintenance of like the long lines on the state system, so all the center lines and edge lines, that is now all done by contract. So we do like two big contracts every year. And those are, um, I believe they get to all of them every year with the long lines, but all of the other stuff that is considered handwork, like symbols, words, bike symbols, um, uh, crosswalks, stop bars, that all has to be done by hand. So you can imagine that's very labor intensive. Um, we have a short construction window where pavement markings can be put down effectively. So that's another challenge that we have in this state. But so we, we are aware of that and we're trying to figure out a way to be you know, more effective at that. And the sweeping as well. That's a, I am talking with maintenance about that too. So. Um, so the question is, are we looking at things other than pavement markings to distinguish bike lanes like different colored pavement? Um, I'm not aware that we've looked into that. My guess is that it's pretty costly. Um, we, I know that we are pretty actively researching different types of pavement markings to see what holds up best. Um, and it's just, it's a real challenge with, you know, snow plowing and people driving over them. And um, actually on Barry Montpelier Road, I know there were like three, three or four different types of pavement markings that were used and there was an evaluation. So we could at least for the green pavement markings we used out there for the bike lanes, um, figure out which one of those products uh, is going to work best for us. So. Sounds like a project I should propose to our research section. <laughs> and my other question is e bikes. The state is really behind on definitions, et cetera, for anything electrical. Scooters, bikes, can you repeat the question? Sure. So that question had to do with e bikes. Um, and uh, you also mentioned scooters. Um, I know that the legislature last session passed, um, or I forget what the right term is, but they um, authorized a pilot study of scooters in Montpelier and Burlington, right? I believe. Really? Okay. I'm, I'm misinformed then. I thought that w that had passed as part of the T-bill. but um, So, yes. So, scooters, I know, is... Um, a one of those emerging issues that we don't have a lot of experience with yet. I know that we have identified that to be discussed in the bike and pedestrian strategic plan that we're starting work on so that we can try to get ahead of that. Um, other states are struggling with that too. You know, do they operate as a pedestrian or a bicycle? So there's a lot left to, or to be figured out as far as that goes. Um, so e-bikes, um, my understanding, if you look at state law right now, um, there is a definition of a, um, uh, an assisted bike that you still have to pedal. And I believe it's up to, no, I think it's 20. I think it's 20 miles an hour or, or some amount of horsepower that is considered an electric assist bike. 
Then there is also a definition of what most people would call a moped, which you are not required to pedal. You can just twist the throttle and you have to have a driver's license. It has to be licensed. So there is some definition in state law already. And, and, it, and it does say that you can use an e-bike anywhere that a bicycle is allowed. So, yep. That you can. There are new e bikes that are out there that run just on the throttle. And you can pedal them also, but you can also just run them around on the throttle. Mm -hmm. Is it a miles per hour or power definition? I'm pretty certain the state statute is both of those it's miles per hour and whatever the horsepower is. It's a fairly low number. So I'm, the question had to do with, you know, are there emerging e-bikes that maybe don't fit or somewhere between those two definitions and that is possible yeah 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 it's a good question i think you know we have to it's another one of those emerging issues that we need to stay ahead of um on the plus side my just anecdotally and just observations i've seen a lot more e-bikes on the street and to me that's good news because it means people are who maybe were intimidated by our hills we have a few of those around here um, we work up at national life so <laughs> very aware of that hill i've biked up it many times um, you know the e-bike kind of helps to break that barrier and get more people interested in biking for transportation so in general i would say e-bikes are a good thing as long as you know we can all play nice together. Well, speaking of playing nice together with e-bikes, there's a difference between having um, licensing requirements and so forth, and companies coming into uh, you know a city mm -hmm. and having e-bikes that can be, I mean, e-bikes or scooters that can be picked up and dropped off. And we've all been reading about whether it's Paris or New York City or Houston or China what happens when those companies come in. And that's something I hope you guys will keep your eyes on. Yeah, so I think the question has to do with what I I think most commonly it's called a bike share program where, and I know that the Burlington area um, is the one part of the state I'm aware of that has a ongoing bike share program that is up and running where you have like the kiosks of bikes and you either unlock them with a credit card or pay ahead somehow online or whatever. Um, and, you know, not to steal what, you know, Dan was talking about in terms of operating versus infrastructure, I don't see VTrans getting heavily involved in bike share um, from an operation standpoint. Um, I think it would be more, you know, uh, a municipality who wants to expand their bike infrastructure if they have a bike share program. Um, so, and I don't, I don't know a lot about the bike share program in Burlington. It seems like it's working fairly well. Um, I know they have an issue, speaking of hills, with people getting the bikes up by UVM and the hospital, taking them downtown, and they end up with a sort of a surplus of bikes down in downtown that then have to be hauled back up to balance the system. Um, but I know they are looking at getting e-bikes added to their, uh, their bike share program. I don't know. Okay, the question was about Granite Street and the grant that we just, so that grant we just awarded to the city. We don't even have our agreement with the city yet. But, oh, the bike path. Yeah. Yeah. Um, this other project that I was talking about is the sidewalk along Granite Street to connect to that path, which the city just got that award. So um, it's. I'm, I don't know, I'm, I, yeah, I think maybe someone from, yeah, yeah, that's more kind of a question for the city, but.
so the question is, I think basically to paraphrase is sort of how do we prioritize roads um, to get paved shoulders for people to be able to bike? Um, and were you talking about going north, like up towards towards Worcester? Or, um, so um, a couple of years ago, we did um, an on-road bike plan where we evaluated the whole state network um, in terms of which roads uh, had the highest potential for biking and there's sort of a dual score. Potential for biking was based on land use and, um, and then we also looked at existing bike use and then kind of put all of that together and came up with a prioritization for the entire state system. So there's now a map, you can find it on our website, that prioritizes all the state routes into either sort of high, medium, or low potential or biking roads, not to say that we will never do anything on a low priority road, but um, given the fact that we have limited resources to help us decide, you know, where are we gonna go kind of the extra effort to widen the road and get a paved shoulder, um, we use that priority map for that. Um, and in general, um, I would say we are trying to get at least three foot paved shoulders when we go out to repave a road. Um, one of the things that, um, without getting too far in the weeds, there's a lot of different treatments we do when we go out and pave a road. They're not all the same. So sometimes we're putting a very thin overlay just to like eke out a few more years. Other times we do what's called a reclaim where we dig everything out and put it back. And then there's like a full roadway reconstruction, which is sort of the highest level. So it kind of depends on what the treatment is as to how much shoulder we might be able to get. But we definitely are actively trying to do that um, wherever it's, you know, there are some roads in the state where it's going to be very tough to get shoulder width because you've got, you know, ledge on one side and a river on the other side. Um, and so we, we, there are some constraints like that, but... Okay, so the question has to do with um, are we looking into like pervious pavement to help with uh, our you know stormwater issues? Um, I know that we have done um, we haven't looked at that as far as shoulders, I don't believe, but I know that there is one uh, park and ride lot in the state, at least one that was done with a pervious pavement where the water goes down through it and that is um, sort of being tracked to see how well that works. Uh, in Randolph. Yep. Can I ask you to share your uh, evaluation and strategic planning and performance metrics with your rail division? <laughs> that, that seems like a, we should be able to do that. <laughs> Um, so I guess the question is, are we looking at a metric of like reducing the number of, uh, cars on the road? Um, yeah, I mean, and connectivity is, is part of that. Um, I guess because we're right at the beginning of this planning process, I don't know if that will be a metric that we'll use that the agency will want to, um, get behind, um, I know that one sort of challenge we have around even, we have very good sort of system in place for counting vehicles. Um, the technology is only kind of catching up now where we can reliably count bicycles um, without like sticking someone out there and having them count. Yep. 
Yep. Right. So that, yeah. I, so I think, yeah. Yeah, so he, he did ask two questions. One had to do with are we going to have a metric about reducing cars um, because there are more, presumably more people would be biking if we achieve all of our goals. And then the connectivity question, um, that, is a, that is something that we look for when we fund um, applications from communities is, you know, does the project contribute to a bicycle or pedestrian network? And I know that there's a lot of planning that happens at the local level um, to figure out what are those networks so that people can safely bike around. And I know Montpelier has done, you know, more than one uh, planning effort to try to figure that out, you know, and figure out where are the gaps. Sure. Yep. Um, so the question was, how is the public going to be involved in our upcoming strategic plan? Um, so we are definitely going to have um, a stakeholders group that will be, you know, interacting with the, we have a consultant that's working on the plan for us. Um, and, um, and then actually we're, we're meeting um, with the consultant for the first time next week. And one of the things we're going to be talking about is the strategy for public involvement. Um, I think there's a lot of different ways we could do that. In the past, we, like when we did the on-road bike plan, we had um, a wiki map that was, people could go online and like leave comments at specific locations and say, this intersection is terrible, or I love biking on this road and that kind of thing. So um, I'm not sure if we'll have something similar, um, but <laughs> there definitely will be lots of opportunity for, for public involvement. Yeah, thank you. All right, Green Mountain Transit. <laughs> this is a bit of a surprise. I'm not with Green Mountain Transit. Uh, my name is Barbara Donovan, and I am the pu Public Transit Program Manager for VTrans. And I just wanted to basically introduce the microtransit project that um, my colleague Ross has been working on with the Microtransit Working Group here in Montpelier um, through of the Sustainable Montpelier Coalition, right? Um, we have worked very closely with this group and one of the things that we did was we have um, put in a grant application for a competitive grant to fund what they are going to tell you about. And we want to work very closely with the Green Mountain Transit to see if this type of experiment, and I'm going to call it an experiment because I'm a little more um, cynical than my colleagues, <laughs> um, to see if it works in an area this size with um, the kind of demand that we have. There is. We haven't seen it yet at the same cost as um, what it would cost to currently ride the buses. However, can we serve more people? Can we expand the reach? Can we do something a little different um, that will then provide more people with more mobility? So. I can now turn it over. We won't know about the grant. We had hoped we would know by tonight, but um, you know, sometimes Washington lets us know in a shockingly short time, and otherwise it could be over a year. So we just don't know the answer to that. But it's if anyone has ever used Uber Pool, it's um, somewhat like that, and we're hoping it doesn't have the same problems as Uber Pool, which only seems to work well in New York City. So. We don't want to be New York City, so we'll do that. So, Jamie Smith from Green Mountain Transit. Do you think? Thank you. Will this reach over here? I have a. Okay. Do you want? Sure. Okay. So, hi everyone. 
Uh, my name is Jamie Smith. I am the Director of Planning and Marketing at Green Mountain Transit. And I'm just here to talk about our services uh, as they fit into the landscape of Montpelier, some of the projects that we have going on. Um, so, Just a little background, uh, if you're not familiar. GMT is a municipality. We're the first and only transit authority in the state of Vermont. Our services span five regions. Uh, you can see we're, we're governed by a 13-member board of commissioners representing all of these areas, including Washington, Lamoille, Franklin County, and Grand Isle counties. Uh, the types of services that we provide in central Ver Vermont are deviated fixed route services, meaning folks who need to have a deviation, uh, the, the route will follow a fixed route if somebody needs to deviate for whatever reason, a medical appointment or not. Uh, the route will, the bus will travel three quarters of a mile off route to serve those folks. Uh, we have commuter fixed route service, e and and Medicaid service. Elderly and disabled. Uh, so this, it's hard to see this map, but uh, this is just a, an overview of the services that we provide in Central Vermont. The upper left-hand corner is the actual uh, Montpelier inset, so that's downtown. Uh, the, the main routes serving downtown are the Montpelier Circulator, which sort of loops around downtown. Uh, that one deviates one half a mile up uh, from its route on, quarter, on request. Uh, the Montpelier Hospital Hill serves downtown Montpelier, the Hospital Hill area connecting to the medical center. Uh, the Capital Shuttle route is a seasonal service route that operates during the legislative session, uh, and that's looping between Department of Labor downtown. Uh, and then the city commuter, which serves from Montpelier, Barry City, City Place. Um, and then we have some regional services that connect through Montpelier, the Waterbury commuter, the US2 commuter, which operates between Montpelier and St. Johnsbury. We operate that uh, in conjunction with RCT, the Montpelier Link Express service, which connects central Vermont and Chittenden County and the Northfield commuter that uh, travels between Montpelier and Northfield. So some of the projects that we have upcoming, um, this is not our project, but we are working with the city of Montpelier. Um, fairly soon, the Montpelier Transit Center will be open. Uh, GMT is expecting to start operating out of that facility in mid-November, fingers crossed. Uh, we believe we're working on some improved routing downtown that will uh, minimize some congestion on State Street. We have lots of buses that travel uh, in that area, so we're hoping to keep them over in the transit center um, and, and minimize some of that congestion. And then uh, the improved routing would lay out, w would come out with our new passenger schedule, which is also expected in mid-November. Uh, the next gen service plan. I'm sure many of you are familiar with that project. It was a two year transportation study that we worked with a consultant. It was a 40,000 foot overview of our services in all of our five regions. Uh, and basically it was an opportunity for us to um, figure out efficiencies. How do we operate our service better? How do we uh, improve, serve the most amount of folks um, efficiently? Uh, we have put that study, uh, uh, the implementation of that study in central Vermont on hold currently. Uh, as Barbara spoke about the, the microtransit service, uh, we had a lot of changes in the downtown Montpelier area that would be affected by the microtransit service if that were to come to, to fruition. So we're working really closely with VTrans as they're uh, awaiting to hear about that grant. Um, so we're excited to explore the benefits of that with them. If microtransit does come to fruition when it comes to fruition, it would likely uh, eliminate the, the three corridor, the three main routes in downtown. Um, that, micro that microtransit service will basically cover that same area. Uh, so back to NextGen briefly. We have suspended that service, but what we're doing as internally is looking at the pieces, parts that won't be affected by the microtransit service. Um, 
and seeing if we can get some of these efficiencies into play for our November schedule. So we're, you know, working on some improved routing, some uh, some service changes in the Barry area uh, to to better serve some of the the hospital and some grocery facilities and things in that area. Um, so I've heard from a lot of folks in the last few weeks about services, not uh, senior services, folks not able to. Um, understand how to use the bus or there's some sort of hesitation or barrier so I wanted to bring up our bus buddy program which is essentially a group of pretty transit savvy volunteers who have uh, volunteered to assist folks who who might have a barrier or are intimidated to ride the bus service so that's a partnership between uh, Green Mountain Transit and neighbor rides uh, in Chinding County but we can do that any in any of our service areas so if folks need uh, that service they can just call Green Mountain Transit and we can connect folks with a volunteer. And then last is uh, some recent technology improvements that we've implemented. So we have launched Transit app, which is a real-time bus tracking and trip planning app. Uh, it's great if you have a smartphone. If you don't have a smartphone, we are about to launch a pilot project in central Vermont, hopefully carrying that into our seasonal service this year, which is a stop ID uh, service. Each of the main stops in Montpelier, the major stops will have an ID number, and folks can call. If you don't have a smartphone, you just have a, a regular phone, you can call. It will tell you when your next bus is going to arrive at that particular stop. And then we also launched an app called Token Transit, which is uh, a mobile ticketing app for us. That was a huge ask f in our last transit development plan from folks uh, to have the ability to buy bus fare on their phone and use it immediately. So we did launch that app in, in June. So that's all I have. Okay. And I also think that the, um, you just having all these apps and things, there are, I do have a cell phone, and I do know how to use the smartphone, but there are an awful lot of seniors who don't, and they, we need some good old-fashioned human connection. Certainly. Those of us who need it. Sure. And want it, and want to stay independent. We understand. Thank you. Uh, not currently, and that was one of the routes that uh, we were sort of soliciting feedback at our public meetings about that route. Um, currently, it operates as two, um, right. Right. Currently in the plan, um, it's not set to operate on the weekends. But certainly after we uh, implement some of these um, next-gen service updates, we are going to be working on a long-term transit plan or a transit development plan, which is a five-year. So with the circular, could you call for a deviation to get to the Amtrak station, which needs to be less than three quarters of the mile? Sure. Okay. If it's less than three quarters of a mile, yes. Oh, on the circular? I think it's constantly. On the circulator? On the circulator, and that's one of the Oh, sorry. She, uh, the question was, can you call for a deviation to get to the Amtrak station? Um, and that you're right, that might be one of our, we have a handful of routes that are half a mile, not three quarters of a mile, like our regular service. So that is one that's a half a mile deviation. So we could or could not? Could not. Amtrak. Could not. There's no way to get to Amtrak from our city. Correct. Certainly, I you know, and we're right. Well, and you know, I will say with that route specifically, uh, with the Montpelier Transit Center, we're looking at essentially 
not to get too far into the weeds, but our operations department, uh, they don't want to make a right-hand turn onto the Taylor Street Bridge for whatever reason. So some of our services are changing quite a bit in the downtown landscape. Um, so we'll have to, we can talk offline about that and I can show you what the routing is going to be. We can see if it would, if it will change or if it matches up. Mm -hmm. No, uh, yeah, I understand what you're saying. Yeah, I uh, certainly. Mm -hmm. uh, per yes, uh, if it's in, the, sorry, with the with the proposed microtransit service, would that solve that problem? So the microtransit service will operate within a five mile, r for, <laughs> yeah, it's, I mean, it basically is serving um, the better part of downtown Montpelier up to the Hospital Hill area. So you would be able to get there with microtransit. Yes. Correct. Sure. Uh, so the service efficiencies that we were looking at making uh, would coincide. They, they couldn't happen without the paratransit service. So with the delay of those changes, we've also delayed the paratransit uh, implementation. So for now, it's still going to be deviated fixed route service. Yes. Mm-hmm. Right. I'm not actually sure why we won't pull in there. I'm sure that our operations department we could answer that. So I'm happy to give you my card and we can. I have your card and I wrote to you. Okay. <laughs> Are you Mary Alice? I'm Mary Alice. <laughs> 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 and I just, I just wanted to make Right, understood. So I have your email, Mary Alice, and I was looking at that before I came here today. So I will work internally with staff to answer some of those questions, and I'll certainly get back to you tomorrow. Do you have any volunteer drivers anymore? They all moved to Florida. <laughs> we do. <laughs> we could always use more. I used to be a volunteer driver, not anymore. Mm -hmm. Yes. As you think about the possible microtransit implementation, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How do you think about the communications and the transition piece to minimize disruption? And maybe that's a question for sustainable mm -hmm. failure, but, but, but it seems to me you're providing that service now. Correct. And it's your service population. So I assume you're thinking about that. We are, and to be clear, it's not a guarantee that Green Mountain Transit will be operating that service. Um, there's certainly a lot of factors in the microtransit uh, program, it could be another provider providing that service. So we we are thinking about it. We're having those conversations with Ross, with Barbara. Um, but, you know, assuming that the grant comes through and all that happens, we'd still have to, as an organization, it would have to go to our board and we'd have to work on a plan at that point once we had approval. Yes. Oh, sure. Uh, the question was about as microtransit comes to to fruition and replaces the downtown uh, transportation services, what outreach um, are we thinking about an outreach plan and what is that plan going to be? Uh, again, I think the questions about the microtransit program are better directed to VTrans at this point. 
And, uh, right. What, what, if any, action has your board yet taken to begin evaluating the potential to run uh, community, community rail? To expand your None at this point. We haven't. Why not? It's a good question. Do you want to <laughs> help with that, Bonnie? Sure. So from a regional planning commission, so what I said back there is I'm Bonnie Wanninger. I'm executive director of the Central Vermont Regional Planning Commission. And in that role, I serve as your commissioner for Washington County to Green Mountain Transit. So from a regional planning commission, earlier I think uh, David mentioned that there is a grant application in to look at what rail might look like through here. We did help author and agree to sponsor that application on behalf of the county, and I think that's the positive move you're looking for. From a Green Mountain Transit perspective, right now Green Mountain Transit runs transit. Transit is rather taxed in the state, which is why we're looking at the next gen plan. Um, we've done a lot of expansion in the past 10 years of fixed route and other types of services that Green Mountain Transit provides, and the state and federal government have been very generous in doing that. Like roads and bridges, we now need to keep operating those routes, and that's been our focus right now, is how do you keep the service you have going while some of these other folks work out that big picture of can community rail actually work in this state? So if you're asking, should Green Mountain Transit start putting together a study and look at internal capacity, it's way too early for the role that Green Mountain Transit might play. So who are the other folks that are going to work out those issues? I hear VTrans saying we're only looking at 40,000 feet. Mm -hmm. And so that additional study, which, which VTrans supported, gets us to that next level. I'm going to get back to you. <laughs> Thanks, Bonnie. Yeah, okay. Great. Thank you. Thank you. All right. And Sustainable Montpelier Coalition. Hi, folks. I'm Dan Jones. I'm the executive director of the Sustainable Montpelier Coalition. Um, I have with me here um, Vanna, White. Vanna White and uh, her <laughs> other assistant. Uh, <laughs> the mind boggles. Uh, hi. Um, I have Elizabeth Parker here, who is our community engagement expert. I have uh, Laura Byron, who is our research director, and they're going to have some parts of this presentation. Um, I get to start off, however. Um, and I wanted to uh, sort of echo something David Blittersdorf started with at the beginning here. Um, we are actually going to be entering more difficult times in the near future. The model that we have had of how transportation works is about to be highly disrupted, both from environmental effects, economic effects, um, and uh, resources uh, such as oil. Because of that, we're now in a situation of trying to look at what are the best new options, whether it's rail uh, for the connectivity between centers. Um, we've been looking at uh, the issue of um, what is happening actually in Montpelier. So many of you may have seen this map before. Uh, we made this up a few years ago. Uh, all the red on there, this is downtown Montpelier. Here's State and Maine, the capital. All the red is off-street parking paved off-street parking. So you can see that a huge percentage of the real estate uh, in town is dedicated to parking. Um, this is not a 
carbon neutral feature of the uh, world right now. It is also not a very good land use because uh, there could be other more housing and commercial spaces in here. Um, according to a study by Stone Environmental, uh, this area here is actually some of the most polluting hard surface along the uh, Winooski, uh, which contributes to uh, the city's role as being a major polluter of uh, Lake Champlain. Um, we have to start thinking about other ways of doing things that don't necessarily require us having so many cars downtown. Um, we've been using the bus service for a long time, uh, the traditional transit fixed route, fixed uh, schedule service, um, which has been basically a service for those people who can't afford uh, cars. Um, and sometimes people don't want to. But we're now coming to a situation in which we've got to start looking at what are the alternatives for being able to get people around because there's been developments in technology that ha allow us to really begin to rethink what it is. And one of the most interesting of these is the whole area of on-demand microtransit. Now, two years ago, or I'm sorry, a year ago this week, we organized a round table up at National Life that several here, people here attended. We had the major employers in town. Um, we had uh, the Development Corporation. We had the Montpelier Alive, um, nonprofits, political and state officers, and started looking at the idea of what could be done. So David gave a presentation on the rail idea that was coming for, uh, through then. We had a presentation on remote parking, and we had a long presentation on from the company Via on on-demand microtransit. Um, this began to give us the idea of a multimodal system that you know things had to work together in a way that they haven't been up until now. So why do we think microtransit is really the next wave? First of all, it's hyper-local. It's a community-based service. Uh, we can configure it as a last-mile service within a four-mile radius of state and main. Uh, last-mile means uh, that this is how you get from the bus or the train or whatever to home and back. It is not uh, intended to get you the long distance. Uh, it can use multi-passenger vans, which are more suitable to the local environment and population. It doesn't require the bigger buses, and then can work on more uh, types of roads. Um, it operates on a software that allows people to call, give their start and end de destinations, allows dynamic routing of the vehicles for the most efficient simultaneous routing of the riders. Well, now this could mean that on your street, you know, or in your neighborhood uh, at 8 in the morning, there's uh, three or four people who want to go downtown to work, and there's another couple of people who want to go to the hospital. And the system is smart enough to know that it would send one van to pick up the people who want to go downtown to work and another one for the people who want to go to the hospital, so we're not duplicating routes. The other beauty of it is, if it's in the middle of the day and there's no demand for riders, rather than keeping running on the same route all the time, we can actually sit there and not uh, burn any uh, fuel. Um, it provides curb to curb service, so like from the middle of the block to, uh, you know, close to where you're going. This is very crucial for people because rather than having to go to a bus stop somewhere else, uh, the service comes to you and it comes to you on your schedule. So you don't have to do a 24 hour um, rerouting uh, demand, okay? You can call on your cell phone, you can call on a regular phone say where you are, where you're going, and uh, you can get uh, service relatively quickly. The, they say the average is 12 to 15 minutes in places that it is operating right now. Um, and properly organized, it can have a massive reduction in local greenhouse gas emissions, and we'll get into a little more of that a little later. So out of the working uh, the round table that we had uh, last year, um, I got a call in uh, mid-November uh, from Ross McDonald, who you keep hearing referred to uh, over at VTrans, who works with Barbara. Uh, and uh, he said, well, I guess this idea has percolated up because I've been instructed to put together a working group and you, Sustainable Montpelier, are going to be our community partner in this. That's great. That may, meant that we got to do all the work uh, with no pay, but uh, it was worth it because it was what we believe is, uh, is needed. Um, Putting together the working group, we had made sure that we had a couple of local uh, counselors on the uh, working group, including Donna and Connor Casey, 
Um, Barbara Conry from the uh, Planning Commission. Um, we had uh, Peter Junkie from the Vermont Center for Independent Living to make sure that the voice of the uh, dis disabled were uh, part of the discussion. Um, and uh, we got the first meeting where we kind of laid out the challenges as we saw them uh, for doing something new in Montpelier. Um, so since we'd signed on to do the R&D report, we uh, were in a situation where we said, okay, what is the framework that we've got to talk about here? You know, because I heard from the questions that were just being given to GMT, et cetera. Well, you know, how are people going to find out about who's, who's this going to serve, et cetera? And uh, so we had to lay out the potential user cohorts and what uh, they needed to be approached for uh, being able to use this. So I'm going to ask Laura to come up for a second and give you a quick description of the research that she did for uh, laying out how this was going to work within the community. All right. Oop, don't trip over that. Thanks. Um, you said me, but it was really we. It was myself, and then Dan was part of it, and a few other people. Um, but so we formed a subgroup of the VTrans Microtransit Working Groups to conduct an extensive market analysis of what on-demand microtransit would look like or could look like in Montpelier. And so our first step was to broaden our understanding of the local market. And uh, we focused on two groups, so the current bus riders, the current users, and then potential new users, who, who would those people be? And for it to work here, um, extensive and focused public engagement has to be a part of it to change transportation behavior. So Elizabeth Parker will talk about that. Um, the market research findings provided to the working group, group included a breakdown of the different cohorts that we researched and we interviewed. And so we made a SWOT analysis, with, which is a strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, threats, for each of the populations we identified. And one user group identified when we met with the Montpelier Senior Center, um, they actually highlighted their excitement at the prospect of offering seniors increased mobility and then the opportunity of aging in place, which was talked about tonight. Um, and finally, we discovered that each potential rider group has specific needs of their own that require different outreach and engagement strategies to develop as a predictable user base. And that's really important. Um, so some of the highlights in our market analysis I'd like to include here. Um, so there's roughly 7,500 people living in Montpelier. And if you take a look at the figures, there's actually almost as many cars in Montpelier as there are people. Um, which is kind of amazing. Um, the paratransit numbers uh, that we received from Vermont Center for Independent Living, Montpelier residents, they're about 235. And then Montpelier senior numbers, people over 65 years old, there's roughly 1,500 people in Montpelier. That's about 20% of the population. And then the last two key figures that we should keep in mind, um, there's 1,150 people who live and work in Montpelier who drive to work and park their cars in Montpelier. So that's a big focus of this. And then of that, um, the state employees, they're another important group here. Uh, 562 Montpelier folks work as a state employee. So numbers to keep in mind. Thanks, Laura. Um, so armed with that, we began to have a picture of what could be uh, a way of approaching this. Uh, we, we have to start with a plan that makes sure that the current user base, okay, is served. That, that, that's our, what we call the do no harm users. Um, and they're going to be the first focus. Uh, Parker here is going to talk in a minute about uh, you know, how we intend to go about this. Um, but we've got to also consider uh, different perspectives, especially uh, an operations experience and uh, other companies. So it wasn't just who the users were going to be, but how could we find the best way of doing this? So we knew that microtransit was happening around the country, whether it was, uh, as Barbara mentioned, Uberpool or, uh, you know, there was this, uh, the main company we'd seen was Via, who seemed to have the best 
uh, operating uh, work. In fact, they're around the world now, uh, and they're uh, quite impressive. Another group called uh, Transloc. Um, we talked to them. We actually re reached out and did a um, had each of them do sort of a pre preview and market analysis of what it would take and how much to just provide service to the current populations, et cetera. So we had something to compare them with. And then we reached out further and talked to cities that were using these services around the country already and seeing what their operational history was, who who was working, who wasn't, uh, what, what, could it, uh, what was needed to work with the uh, users. And one of the things that was very clearly brought out initially was while the software, you know, was getting improved all the time while the uh, the ability of this to actually pick up people within the time that it said etc so again no longer calling 24 hours ahead of time it's 15 minutes you can uh, get a call in unless you had a way of reaching out informing the public training the public different co cohorts within the public have different requirements and making sure that they understand it it will be a failure so I'm going to uh, turn this over for uh, you know to Elizabeth for a second, uh, Parker here to talk a little bit about what we're intending for a uh, training program, which Ross has said uh, he you know and uh, VTrans believes has to be part of any introduction to microtransit. Hi. So I just wanted to say that. I am car liberated, which means I don't have a car and I use public transit as my main way of getting around. So I have been back in central Vermont for seven years. So I'm a regular GMT rider, a grateful GMT rider, and I know very well um, what the current rider population is, I've become friends with them as part of the culture of actually riding the bus is becoming friends with all these different people. So I just wanted to give you that as an overview. So our question is, you know, how do people learn to use a new service? How do they go from fixed route, fixed schedule to this much more flexible uh, way of, of working? So um, this past... Um, gosh, was it this past spring, um, when uh, Laura was working on the market analysis and development plan, I was starting to, and developing, Laura and Dan and the whole subgroup that worked on that uh, that analysis actually went out and met with all these different groups. It is a, a long list of groups that they went and met with and formed relationships with. And so um, I started to think about, well, that's great to get that analysis, but how will we make that transition? How will we partner with the VCIL, with um, <clears throat> uh, Capstone, Another Way, all the, the important groups, and there are many more than that. Uh, and so um, what started to form was a writer engagement and marketing plan. And some of the features that uh, are really important to promote in this plan are the that microtransit has an ease of use, flexible scheduling, shorter transit times, and a greater range of travel. And uh, in one of the things that it's also driving the plan that I've started to write is customer feedback, driving, uh, driving how we uh, continue to engage uh, riders and current, u current riders and transition them. Uh, so I have done a two-year plan because the project is going to be running for two years in six phases. The first phase is uh, uh, developing a foundation. And one of the things that um, in Laura's research na nationwide, uh, we realized that it's super important to get um, the kind of base data of wh what people are currently doing and to start to interact with the current riders. So, uh, Having done some work in this in the past, I, my uh, idea was to do a survey of the current riders. And uh, so it turns out that the Montpelier Senior Center has already offered to help uh, conduct that survey. So we're very happy about that partnership. Uh, th another important thing that we learned uh, from the national study is that it's important to create a strong brand identity. So uh, that's part of the developing a foundation. And that would be 
in the months of February through April of 2020. And then the other thing we learned uh, from the national, uh, other national programs was that it's great if you can have a best practices um, and uh, a way of uh, recording best practices and integrating them into training and protocols. So phase two, after developing that foundation of, and, and, and what I'm suggesting in, the, in uh, that first phase is just creating a place where the, those best practices can be recorded so that they can be integrated. In phase two, it's transitioning the current riders. So um, at that point, the initial survey would be done. We would have more data to help us. And then we would be working, as I said before, with the organizational partners. And uh, we would begin um, actual rider recruitment, um, working with those organizational partners to help us uh, communicate with the populations that they work with, and also doing uh, very targeted outreach to current riders. According to GMT's current numbers, um, there are an average of 174 rides per day for these three uh, fixed route, fixed schedule buses that, um, that uh, Jamie talked about as being um, replaced by a microtransit. So 174 rides translates to 87 riders. So it's, um, I, it's really hard because we don't have the data on how many individuals, but it is uh, not a, a huge number, but a very important number. Um, and then I would be developing uh, a uh, media campaign uh, to do short videos to explain to people that can be put out on social media. Um, and as Mary Alice said, there are sometimes some different needs for seniors who are not on social media. However, my experience of riding the bus is that many, many people are on social media, so that will be one way of doing it. Working through the Senior Center as a partner will be another. And so finally, there would be the product launch in July of 2020. Uh, and then, uh, so our first and main focus is transitioning current users. Our second focus would be adding new users. And so um, there will be four different kind of low-hanging fruit, as we've already described. The uh, seniors, uh, the senior center has, uh, you know, is interested in this project, and uh, there are 1,500, approximately 1,466 seniors over 65 in Montpelier. Uh, we would then work on recruiting legislators. There are 180, not all of them spend the night in Montpelier, but many do. 491 lobbyists and 90 support staff. And, okay, yes, I know, I know, I love my numbers. And then uh, we would work on recruiting state employees, the 550 who live and work in Montpelier, and then finally go on to uh, smaller employers. And so as we go around town f over the course of the last year, it's amazing because whereas you know, I would say on-demand microtransit, and people go, what? And that now people are like, yeah, I've heard about that. That's kind of interesting. When, when is that happening? What's going to happen? So there's starting to be a buzz about it. And, um, and so our goal is to exceed the 25% uh, increase that VTrans has sent. And we feel that with all the numbers of people who are out there, uh, that that'll be easily done. So thank you. Okay, just following up on a couple of things. Out of the research that we had done about nationwide stuff, uh, Ross uh, and the uh, group determined that the company VIA would be the best software partner that would be uh, had in this because they had the most sophisticated software. So that was included in part of the development plan um, and the FTA grant was uh, submitted, as uh, Barbara noted, uh, you know, but when it will be <laughs> revealed is yet to know, but it will make a uh, make a more robust entry, although, as from what I understand, the uh, pilot is included in the legislative uh, budget for uh, being, you know, put in f from uh, VTrans to the legislature. So uh, we're hoping that it's going, uh, going to be happening one way or another. Uh, that will be, to some degree, up to the legislature to determine. 
City support is going to be crucial for this, not necessarily money, although I, you know, uh, we want to make sure that's in there somewhere. But uh, this is going to be a community-wide effort to try and reimagine how transportation can work. Instead of just thinking of it in terms of the bus system, what we're looking at is a way of actually getting people out of their cars and into town because many of us, oh, you mean I could call, I could get downtown, I don't have to park, I can get home, I don't have to uh, worry about uh, parking or chipping the ice off the car. Well, now that has some uh, you know, definite advantages and appeals. So everybody we've talked about it with is that, well, yeah, actually, it's kind of like that. Uh, the uh, besides the land use shifts that we uh, talked about that uh, would be possible if we can get enough uh, cars off the road, the city has a goal, uh, like much of the state, of reducing greenhouse gases uh, by 25% by 2025. Now, right now, the assumption is doing this with EVs. Uh, Every you know, 900 EVs would have to be purchased and brought on the road. Uh, we could actually do the uh, same, say, serve the same number of people with 50 vans, um, and uh, think about the land use savings and the cost savings if that were uh, possible, if this were convenient enough, and we believe it will be. So uh, we think once once it gets going, people are going to be excited and uh, embrace it. Uh, shared convenient transit is our best shot to provide, uh, you know. Uh, a low-cost alternative to large-scale purchases of EVs. Future developments uh, will be crucial to the pilot. And to meet our goal of reducing the city's uh, greenhouse gases, you know, we're going to have to get internal combustion engines off the road. So the question is, what's the most efficient, cost-effective way of doing it? This will make this project eligible, if we can achieve that, for funding and support from the Transportation Climate Initiative, or TCI as it's called. It's, it's only becoming uh, developed now, but uh, it could become a major uh, source of support in the future. So over here, uh, Parker has created today a... Uh, Yes, I know. Um, uh, so you can have an idea of all, what a modi, multimodal system Sorry. looks like, uh, you know, and the, the different pieces of it, which you've been introduced to some degree tonight. And the, uh, you know, this is a way of beginning to imagine how things could shift in the future rather than being entirely dependent on the personal car. And so that's what we'd like to uh, leave you with and uh, any, accept any questions that you might have now. Oh, circle. Okay. So, you know, we'll start with the GMT commuter bus, commuter rail, uh, you know. Uh, uh, no, 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 let's, let's slow down because we got more to do. There's intercity. Inter okay. Intercity is, is, are these two. Intercity which is within the city, are these two. You can't and just say these two. You have to okay, the, uh, yeah, this is, uh, so this is the bike, sh a possible bike share, car share. Etc. This is uh, on-demand microtransit as uh, that. Okay. When we get to uh, the intracity, uh, intracity. Now you've got the buses like Greyhound, uh, Megabus, or whatever. You've got uh, the interregional rail, Amtrak, whatever. That uh, and. Um, we think that there's a place for car share to come back, and we've been looking at that as the possibility of creating, in essence, a um, co-op, which would bo both do car share and bike share. And we've just been exploring that for right now. It's no nothing to propose to you yet, but it uh, has some interesting ideas. And then finally, the uh, you know in intercity, the commuter bus uh, from GMT and the uh, commuter rail, uh, because so like the Barry. Link, uh, you know, the Barry commuter or the Link bus, et cetera, are all fitting into those uh, areas. So this gives you an image of how it all begins to fit together in a pattern. Now, this is a way of, like I said, supplementing what we're now co uh, d committed to with the uh, personal car. Okay, Jack. Dan, I thought I heard you say that the uh, on demand micro transit would require 50. No, I was using that as a comparison. I said, uh, to uh, a court. 
Huh? The, it would, uh, he th thought he heard me say the uh, microtransfer will require 50 vans. It will start with five vans, okay, and build. What we're, we're saying is the numbers we've gotten already from VIA, and they be, may be actually more demanding than we think, uh, says we can displace 900 cars with 50 vans. Okay, that, that's where that number came from. The 900 cars is that 25% reduction in uh, greenhouse gases if they were uh, in internal combustion. You know. The, the vans are usually somewhere in the uh, neighborhood of seven to nine passenger. Yes? How will you price the service compared to the bus? Uh, that's going to be dependent on the uh, amount of use. In other words, the, the first year it's going to be at a price at a dollar per ride. Uh, and then it will be see what, you know, what the demand curve is. We don't actually have an answer to this yet. I know, so. I know, I know but however, th there are currently subsidies for um, depending upon um, earnings, and so those subsidies would con be continued, and we would work with Capstone in order to work out how that would happen. But but for regular users, that will be dependent on the demand. If we need 50 vans, they're going to have to be paid for somehow. If you can imagine, however, that it costs you, according to AAA, $8,500 to keep a car on the road, and there are 2,000 second cars uh, in Montpelier, if we could displace a fair number of those, that would be a huge savings for the potential users, even if uh, it was $200 a month for this because you wouldn't need the car anymore. <laughs> yes, Bill. Within the, the existing routes within town. Right. So my question is: Is the money that is used to fund those bus services sufficient to fund? It, it is it's sufficient to fund the startup. Is is the money that is going to be allocated that now pays for the bus routes within Montpelier, the Circulator, Hospital Hill, Capital Shuttle? Is that sufficient to pay for uh, the uh, startup, the pilot project? Yes, it is. It is budgeted for five vans. Uh, operating with, uh, since you, we've all seen the circulator riding around town with one person in it, uh, we, we think this is a, uh, a very easy um, possibility. Yes, sir. You. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I, 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 my mistake. No, this is not from Senior Activity Center. This is demographics. No, this is demographics from the American Family Survey part of the census. Was from the senior center. Uh, and I'm on the yeah, it's 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 not. I'm sorry if if that was what it seemed like. I misspoke. If it was, it was the American Community Survey, the Montpelier Senior Center. We spoke to. We didn't get any demographics from them specifically. Oh, okay. Yes, but uh, uh, Mary Alice, Laura was doing the research. The numbers come from the American Community Survey under the census. We we will do that as soon as they are co conveniently available. Well, <laughs> ma'am. Rather, it's, it's rather than ask a question, if that's all right with you. Thank you for generously handing over the microphone. I actually am um, not understanding that this was more of an information gathering session than a forum um, put together. So if I could just share this with you folks. And I just wanted to say, uh, first of all, that it was so exciting to hear all these presentations as a, as a resident of Montpelier. It's 
truly deeply exciting. I wanted to point out tonight um, the net zero competition a few years ago, and it's fascinating to me how closely we are detailing and preparing for the future according to the ideas that came up in the net zero competition. So what this handout does is it has a few excerpts from the different teams that, that uh, competed. On the back, there are two images um, which I, I found inspiring. And on the front is comparing three of the team's uh, priorities uh, around, uh, well, I was actually focused on parking, um, but also uh, uh, pedestrian, uh, mass transit, enhanced rail, bus service, and the benefit of increased density. I wanted to make out two, add two points, which I feel like are the, perhaps the um, trajectory of now we're in 2019. They're on the right hand of the, of the top side. And um, the, f the most important thing I think is happening is, is the growth of the net zero movement is this importance of getting rid of cars. And um, it is 10% uh, of the energy that goes into making a vehicle up front. It, uh, sorry, the energy used to make a vehicle is 10% of its total life energy usage. It's a really big number. And if we could get every family that has two cars to reduce down to one, that alone would be a huge, huge thing. So and it's not just a question of people who live here daily mass transit, uh, or sorry, transportation choices. It's got, to it's got to address the odd trips, which would cause a person to buy a car rather than to use other methods. And so I want to add two more things that haven't been discussed tonight, just so that we're all thinking about them. The other is um, the cab service, which we do have here, and Lyft and Uber, which I've used a lot in other cities. I think that the more options we have, the more little circles on that diagram, the better. Um, and uh, the other, uh, the hitching post that's started in Worcester is, is fantastic. Um, the other is um, there are a number of different options for people who need a car, unusual, you know, say they need to go to someplace that's not on a public transit route, that's outside the cir circuit of the mass transit or the local is, um, so, so say you needed to go to uh, uh, Dartmouth Hitchcock or Stoddard, New Hampshire. There are what in Boston, for instance, there are ways that you there's apps where you can rent someone's private car, so you wouldn't have to get out to Enterprise, rent a car, and then drive to New Hampshire. Um, so, uh, I just I'm overwhelmed. It's so great that everyone's already um, done so much that's been discussed on the, the in that big competition. Um, I wanted to point out my other thing is that we really need to think um, outside of who lives in Montpelier and think about the larger network. I have many friends who are um, getting homebound in Worcester, uh, Middlesex, and I'm glad that the, the Central Vermont Regional Planning Commission is coming soon to talk about that. But I, I, what I wanted to point out here is what the three groups talked about, which is, I think, a critical concept, is that to really get people out of their cars, we need to think of the walkable distance in Montpelier is a, very soon a car zone, a car-free zone. And that there will be a periphery around the city, um, maybe an inner circle and then an outer circle of satellite parking. All, uh, th at least three of the four teams emphasized how important that is. So that when a visitor gets to Montpelier, they have they would then have these options they would basically become like a citizen as they start to move around in the circle of montpelier that is going to be critical for everybody to be able to get rid of cars even people outside of montpelier because there will be other kind of transportation ways for them to get to the satellite parking or the nodes that will develop on the edge of town um, that would um, if we can get to a car-free downtown, be able to take advantage of all those spaces. And then over time, as the networks can grow and expand even more, then even the satellites parking spaces can be used for higher purposes. And I agree with something Ann told me this summer, that those satellite parking spaces should not be on virgin land, 
which can be used for other things. We have plenty of existing satellite parking areas already that just need to be used and be thought of as, as peripheral nodes to the central node idea. Um, I think that was it. Thank you. That was two minutes. <laughs> yes. You'll be happy to know that Micro Transit will take you to the uh, Amtrak station. And, and uh, so, yeah, I think we have to have a way of reaching out media to educate the public in Vermont that you don't need five cars. You know, it's like, tone it down. It's, what, what is it really? We don't have to have all these people drive into Montpelier. I used to live on Washington Street in Barrie. Uh, well, that's what we're trying to accomplish with the microtransit project, which is to make it more convenient, more personally available, closer to their, uh, and, uh, and we, that, as exp uh, Elizabeth explained over and over, that we are trying to educate, we will be trying to educate and reach out and make sure that there is a community engagement process. One, one little bit. No, you, 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 you can't shut up. <laughs> says Dan. Uh, so anyway, one of the things that we've talked about is uh, with the Vermont State Employees Association uh, is the idea of climate heroes and the idea of making microtransit a benefit for uh, state office workers and so, you know, how that can happen. So we're starting to think creatively and that's just one example of several that we're working on. Yes, and a number of the uh, employers in town are very interested in this and are, would actually like to do it earlier than we believe is uh, possible because there's going to be a shakeout period where we figure out how it all works. So, Deb. Oh, I, can you? Yes, of course you can. You know, and, and thank you for the comment about the sustainable uh, Montpelier design competition, which uh, my buddy Deb here and I uh, managed. So... Uh, <laughs> Uh, we've talked a lot on transportation tonight, and uh, it would be remiss not to mention uh, Go Vermont, which is a clearinghouse right at the state of Vermont at VTrans, a clearinghouse connecting commuters.org. And that is a place where you can find all transportation options and a guaranteed ride home if you carpool, uh, take, take a van pool or whatever, all this information is online and available while we're waiting for microtransit and trains. That's something we can use right away. So 1-800-685-RIDE, this is a commercial, <laughs> is where you can get a transit plan tonight. Uh, yes, question? Uh, for, it is focused primarily on people who work, not on seniors, not on, not on people who are, have disabilities. I went up there, I was actually quite disappointed that those, that it's focused almost entirely on people who work. A lot of it is on the commuter, on workforce. But we're working in the trenches, honestly. I'm there working for Go Vermont in the trenches, getting people to jobs, to training, and putting people together with each other to get there. So if we'll sit down offline and we'll talk. You didn't talk to me when you went to go to Vermont. <laughs> so question. question. I don't know. Thank you.
So the question was about uh, having access to the presentation site and the graphics and information and whatnot. I think that seems pretty easy to do. So um, if uh, pre the presenters are still here, uh, if you just send me uh, either presentations or uh, graphics, et cetera, we'll make that happen. Great. Thank you. Great question. Steve. Well, the last part of that is uh, not my purview, so I'm uh, uh, staying out of it. The first part of it, uh, well, the first part of it is what the city is trying to do tonight is begin to open this discussion. So thank you to uh, the mayor, et cetera, so that we can begin having this discussion about what can we do. Yes, there probably should be a uh, more formal way of handling this, but uh, like David started earlier, like I was saying, we are in this paradigm shift. We don't know how it's going to come out. Uh, we're trying to, that's why we, you know, are the, created the Sustainable Montpelier Coalition, which is to say, how can we focus just on what's going on here in town and be an independent voice for this work, as opposed to saying the governmental voice? Doesn't mean, no, go away. No, no, no. Yeah. <laughs> Go, what's your no, comment? No, I, I just wanted to say that already we've had several meetings with um, with uh, All Earth Rail uh, in talking about where the potential uh, train stops would be because that's integral to understanding uh, some of the microtransit uh, process. So that that kind of stuff is already happening. The main thing to remember is. This is the beginning of something that is, uh, you know, we're in historical change and uh, we're going to have to work together and this is where the city, we're trying to be a conduit for helping the citizens have communication with the city, treating them as allies, not as uh, antagonists. That we're, you know, we're all in this together to figure out how to get through this bump and we're doing it in a wonderful small city that has the capacity because of the people who live here to make change if they so choose, which is not going to be the same for a lot of other places. So that's why we think we can do stuff fairly quickly here. We can do stuff that will be noticed elsewhere and with stuff that will improve the life uh, of the people who live here by working together. So that's our All right, well, thank you everyone for coming out tonight. And if you have more questions, um, certainly please feel free to follow up with any of uh, the presenters. Uh, that, I believe, concludes uh, the, uh, the forum for this evening. Thank you all again for coming out.